Okay, everybody, it's 4.30. I'm going to go ahead and get started just to be respectful of your all's time. Thank you for joining um, the call, the webinar today. On the right-hand panel of your uh, webinar, if you're online, if you're looking at it, you'll be able to type in questions in the chat. Um, otherwise, you can raise your hand if you can do that via phone or via the um, web browser and we'll try to get to you. I'm going to go over some of the basics of the Schweitzer Fellows Program and then we have um, one and we're maybe going to have another uh, fellow and, and past fellow on the call today so I'm going to let them talk about their experience. So to get started, this is a webinar about the Chicago Area Schweitzer Fellows Program. My name is Maya. I am the director of the program here in Chicago um, and I'm going to give you an overview of what, what this program is about. Um, again, the most important part of this, um, this session is for you all to get out of it what you want to know. So I'm, I want it to be responsive. So if you have any questions, please feel free to bring them up um, at any point throughout the webinar. So what we have here is an interdisciplinary program. Um, it's prestigious. It's 30 uh, fellows per year. I'll get into some more of the details later on in the, in the webinar. Um, but just to give you a sort of broad picture, it's a 200 hours of direct service. You have a cohort um, of, of 30 folks from different disciplines. And for many um, of the fellows who participate, it begins a lifelong commitment to service in their careers. Um, it gives you a chance to get out of the classroom and get into the community. You're actually face-to-face -face with community members through this, this program. There's also a stipend associated, $2,500 stipend, and an active um, alumni network. The core of the work that you are doing, I'm sorry, there's a train outside. I'm right in downtown Chicago, so you'll hear them going by every once in a while. If it's hard to hear, go ahead and um, type that in, and I'll try to make some fix something about it. Um, so what, what you're doing, the core of the work is designing a project um, that is entirely your own, of your own design, that includes um, evaluation um, as well as, uh, as uh, mentorship components. We have student mentors, we have faculty mentors and mentors that are aligned with a, a site, a community site, which is where your project will be housed. So where did it start, right? The Schweitzer Fellows Program is named for Albert Schweitzer, who's a Nobel laureate, um, and uh, had a program that he ran through a hospital that he founded in what is now Gabon, Africa. So that program took a rotation of medical students from Boston, and they went over to the hospital and they learned about service, basically. So one of those fellows came back here 25 years ago, and he decided that there was plenty of work to be done in our own communities here in the States. So he founded the US chapters. Um, there are now 12 chapters. Chicago is the largest of those chapters um, and one of the most successful. We have a lot going for us. We're very proud of our chapter. We have a very active alumni group that um, spreads all over Chicago, but also all, all over the nation. We are housed at Health and Medicine Policy Research Group here in Chicago, which is a policy think tank. Um, and it's unique to, to our chapter that we have this connection to the policy and the, the upstream impacts of, of the things that we're seeing out in the community as we're doing these kinds of projects. So it's an exciting element of the program. So why, right? Why do we, do, why do we need this kind of a fellowship? Um, why do we do community work in the first place? Chicago, as many of you may know, um, is ripe with in inequities and inequalities. Um, and the segregation um, of Chicago is one of the most rampant in the country and in the world. And so see in this map, this is from CDPH, the Chicago Department of Public Health. They've done a ton of great work with, um, with data around inequities. So this shows you life expectancy differences. Um, the white parts, the affluent parts of Chicago have life expectancies uh, between 80 and 83 years. And then the poorer parts of Chicago have uh, life expectancies between 65 and 71 years. Um, so that's kind of the, the, these foundations of what we're working on are based on the social determinants of health is what we call them. So it's the ways in which we're able to live 
gain education, have access, ooh, I'm scrolling fast, <laughs> have access to green space, have access to, um, to good quality food. Um, so that's at the core of what we're looking at is, is kind of health in, a, in the broader context. We use the World Health Organization definition of health, which is not just, you know, do you have a cough? It's, do you have a place to go to school? Are you safe? Um, the, the sociological, environmental, social, political factors that impact people's well-being and really are the determinants of whether or not they have good health. Um, your, pro, your project that you're going to that you're going to do for this year-long fellowship has to serve an, an underserved uh, population. So that can be defined a lot of ways, but typically that's low-income, underinsured. Um, a minority or ethnic group, immigrants, and so forth. Um, so when you propose a project, you have to think about whom you're going to serve, what community group you're going to work with. There's a few really good resources um, to look at. Those include uh, Healthy People 2020, which is this national um, project to think about what the health priorities are, health equity priorities are for the country. Um, a related document is Healthy Chicago 2.0, which is a document based on Chicago's specific health priorities. So if you're not from Chicago or you just have questions about what a project might look like, those are really good resources. Again, please type in questions or use your raise hand function if you have something more specific you'd like to know about. Our program here in Chicago is strengths-based. So um, a lot of typical programs or community work are based around deficits, right? Like what's wrong with this community? Um, what's not going right here? What do we need to fix, right? And so we're trying to think about shifting that paradigm and talking more about what assets and strengths exist in communities and how we are able to leverage those and help people help themselves, basically. Um, think about ways to learn from community and um, help leverage what they're doing and what they're doing well. Um, we're also, really committed to the idea that we're not out there doing charity work. This is not about going out and saving people. Um, it's about empowering and working together with communities and learning a lot, right? Listening a lot, building trust together. I'm not quite done with that slide. <laughs> um, and thinking creatively. So we want you to build a project that is meaningful to you, that approaches an issue um, or a health topic in a, in a creative way that can look like, you know, dance. If you're passionate about dance, it can look like um, arts projects. It can definitely look like more health specific in a traditional way projects, but it can also be something more creative. We want you to think about health and responses to um, issues of health in a creative way. A typical comment we hear from fellows and, and past fellows is I gained as much from my project as I gave to the community. And some fellows choose to uh, work with communities that they have a connection to in some way. So either that it's part of their identity or part of their experience, that's often a good motivator. We want you to be thinking about doing a project. It's 200 hours, right? So we want it to, do, to be something that feels, um, that feels like a passion project, not like work, right? We want you to feel like it's something that inspires you and helps you get through the work of school or the work of, of a job that you have because it's, it, you're able to go out and, and gain from this experience. So there are 30 fellows that are selected each year out of about 100 applicants. We are looking for a diversity in background, discipline, project idea, population, um, volunteer or community engagement experience, uh, you know, folks who are from Chicago, folks who aren't from Chicago, what makes for a really rich cohort is having a mix of a lot of different elements. This year, for example, example we have 11 different university health-related programs represented, including dentistry, medicine, um, nursing, disability study, studies, uh, physical therapy, dietetics, public health, et cetera. So there's a social work, there's a whole lot of things going on here. And that really makes for a rich experience for the people in the cohort, because they're not only learning about their community, they're learning about themselves. And they're also learning, you know, if you're, if you're a med student, you're learning about what is it that a disability studies person is going through? What is their program like? What is, what are the core tenets of that study, right? So there's something really rich about that dynamic. 
Um, this year we have 11 different schools represented, so we're also looking for, for that diversity and richness. Um, folks are motivated by the same thing who come together in this fellowship. So we like to talk about a like-minded cohort of idealists, and that continues after. People are gathering for years and decades to come to find that same group of people who believe in social justice or social change in these ways that are really important to keeping motivated in your providership. So program elements and requirements. There's the project itself, which is 200 hours of service, 130 of which must be direct. So it's not, um, it's not a, uh, a research project. We want you to make sure that you know that. Um, it's, a, it's a project that's direct service, one-on-one -on -one with the community. Um, interdisciplinary, we have an orientation that's in April. Um, at the end of April, it's and we also have monthly meetings that are downtown, mostly here in our Chicago um, downtown offices. We also are doing some at, at community sites. So a fellow will be working at a community site and we'll go to that site so that we can all learn about that community organization um, and meet there. You have monthly reports that you send. So I mentioned your mentors, all of your mentors stay connected. There's reports that you send to everybody um, and then there's a stipend. Talked about this a little bit. Um, you're also part of an interprofessional learning collaborative. What's exciting about that is what I talked about a little bit ago is if you're learning about other people's areas of study and focus, this is a really good opportunity um, to deep dive together with five or six of the fellows in the cohort, like a mini group, where you learn about something specific of your choosing and of your direction. Um, so it's an exciting opportunity to really get to know people and get to know their areas of study and their approach to different topics. Again, strength-based projects focus, 200 hours, working with the existing community organization. Um, you don't have to have this selected when you apply. It's nice to do some groundwork now or, or before the application period. You know, if you are not from Chicago or even if you are going and talking to a community organization, letting them know what this, um, what this fellowship is about and seeing if they're able to host you and to let you do sort of a project of your own because it's not traditional volunteering, right? You're not gonna show up and just do whatever they say for 100, 200 hours, right? You're there to do specific work, to think about something. Um, the first 20 hours, you're gonna be going in, listening, asking questions, trying to figure out what your project really is gonna be about. And then you're gonna build this project and this program of your own. Right? So you want to make sure that they understand that, make some inroads, but you can apply without a site and you can apply without a super firm idea as well. That's because we're hoping that part of the learning of this fellowship is about that process, is about going into a community, listening a lot, thinking about the, the strengths and assets that they have going for them and helping them figure out what it is that they want to focus on and that they want to focus on with you together throughout the fellowship year. We have a community site guide. So if you are interested in knowing more about um, Chicago organizations, maybe you don't have one in mind, you're interested in looking over what we have pulled together, we're happy to send that to you um, in the follow-up email. Um, and it's a, it's a good resource because it has information about um, what the site hours are, uh, where they're located, if they're on a CTA line, a bus line or a train line. That's important. We like you to think about something that's convenient, right? And I say that only because it's a, bit, it's a big commitment. We want you to be able to get there. Um, we definitely have fellows who choose sites that are far from where they live and they make it work. But if it's possible, also think about, you wanna be working in your neighborhood or your community, right? Because it's kind of the point is to get to know your neighbors and get to know uh, the folks that are around you and what, what strengths and assets exist in the very place where you live or you study or you work. So think about that in your choice. Uh, we'll be sending out that site guide. And also if you have other questions, Again, apologies about the train. If you have other questions about um, a site or an organization that might be a good fit, we're happy to help you find something that would be a good fit. Okay, let's see if we have, we have two fellows who might be on the call. It looks like, looks like we have one. Um, Jessica, if you're on the call, please go ahead and like raise your hand or use the chat. I don't see you on there, but if you are, let me know. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and skip ahead to Vivica, who's on the call. 
let me get you unmuted. Can you talk and Hello. see if we can? Hey, hi. Hi. So Vivica is on the call. She was a fellow um, two years ago and is currently a student mentor to our current class of fellows. And uh, she's gonna give you a little information about what her fellowship experience was like, um, some of the more meaningful parts for her and, uh, and some takeaways, and then she'll be available throughout to answer questions as well. Um, and maybe she can talk a little bit about mentorship, whatever inspires you, Vivica, go ahead. Yeah, so um, my uh, fellowship experience was in 2019 and 2020. So, or sorry, it was 2018, 2019, and I had a mentor in the 2019, 2020 class. So um, I did my project at the Night Ministry with uh, homeless youth ages 18 to 24. And the project was about life skills and wellness um, for the youth. So we covered topics such as uh, health literacy, uh, nutrition, tobacco cessation, uh, first aid, um, oral hygiene, of course, because I'm a dental student, uh, financial literacy, and yeah, there was just a bunch of other topics. So uh, what we, what was like really meaningful to me throughout this experience was just how much you learn about yourself and about the communities that you work with. So we're often like put in a place where we think that we're going to be helping others, but this fellowship really helps you gain um, knowledge about yourself and how you can uh, improve your own communication skills or your own judgments or your intrinsic values um, and how you can improve just simply as a person. So this, it was really an invaluable experience and I would do it again in a heartbeat. Wonderful, thank you. So we have a couple questions and I'm gonna read them out. I don't think, Vivica, I think, you, can you see them? You're on, you're on the phone, uh, right? Hey, yeah, I'm on the app, hold on. I think I okay. can. <laughs> no, it's okay, no. I can read them out and then we can answer okay. them together. Um, okay. So one question is, is this program open to students that have already earned an MPH but are still in a professional program? Um, the answer to that is yes. Uh, as long as you're enrolled at least until December of 2020 in a graduate program, this fellowship is open to you. Um, the next question is, do you have suggestions on how to approach community organizations? I met with someone from an organization who seemed generally interested um, in having a project uh, with them, but not sure the next steps. Should I provide them with a detailed plan? Um, that's a great question. Vivica, do you want to speak to that? I can also go ahead. I'm not sure she's still there. Um, so a great answer to that is, is um, if, you've, if you've already given them an overview, that's great. Uh, it's, it's great to give them a sense of what it is that you are hoping to do. Um, but also remember that we want you to be flexible, right? Because you might have a really great idea, but you might show up and learn that your community organization isn't really interested in that. The community that members themselves already have or have different priorities. So we want you to build a relationship with the organization um, and give them an idea of what it is that you're gonna be responsible for, right? You're gonna be responsible for a certain number of hours. Um, you have to uh, do evaluations of your own, that sort of thing. And you'll need to have somebody at that site who's willing to mentor you. Um, so you can talk them through that a little bit. We also have, um, a really useful one pager if it's an organization that's unfamiliar with the Schweitzer Fellows Program. Uh, we have a like an informational sheet which I will send in the follow-up um, or I can send to you if you if you write to me um, and it it gives you or gives the organization rather an overview of what it is that the program's about, what our priorities are, a little bit about our history. So sometimes that can be useful to organizations that are a little less familiar with our with our program to give them an overview. Um, one thing to remember, though, when talking to them is to really give them confidence that you're there to, to serve the folks in the community. So you're interested in knowing what it is the priorities are of the existing people there um, and, and to, to kind of emphasize that, that that's a big part of what we do in this program. Please ask a follow up in the, in the pane if that doesn't answer the question thoroughly. The next question is. For Vivica, how were you able to choose uh, what your project would be? What led you to choose the night ministry? 
Uh, well, the project itself on, um, okay, so the night minish, I kind of like figured out um, the population that I wanted to serve first. Um, I think that was like an important step for me because at the beginning when I was writing my proposal and stuff, like I just was kind of all over the place. So um, I think like maybe try to figure out what type of population you want to serve. And then from there, I researched organizations that um, like served homeless um, people in general. And then um, I narrowed it down to organizations that did like youth services. And um, I came across the night ministry actually through the, um, the I don't know what it's called that like, uh, like the Schweitzer fellowships um, past fellows site yeah what is it called the site guide yes yeah okay the site guide yeah so that's like where I came across the night ministry and then I called them or emailed them and they initially like uh, were not sure if they could use me and so they like they um basically emailed all of their managers for their different sites and somebody um contacted me and saying like hey yeah I could use you at my place and that's how I got connected to um, the crib, which is like one of the emergency youth shelters that the night ministry has. Yeah. Great. Next question is, can you elaborate on the monthly reports and what they entail? Sure, absolutely. So a monthly reports, there's a form. So it's super easy to, um, you just respond to a series of, of questions and prompts. Um, they are sent then to your student mentor, your site mentor, your faculty mentor, um, and our staff here at the fellowship. Um, and they they really, uh, you can send photos as well as, as, as text, and they're really a chance to check in with you. So they ask you about your progress on your goals. Uh, we use them to track your hours. Um, and, and, you know, if there's anything you want to bring up, if there's any boulders or stumbling blocks you've run into. Uh, so they're, they're kind of the convening, like the, the central communication document between all the different parties. We do that on purpose because we want it to be something that's fairly easy for um, all parties involved, for your mentors. We don't want to make them you know, meet with all of us multiple times, uh, try to schedule all kinds of meetings. We're trying to keep it pretty simple for folks. And this is a really good tool to be able to communicate um, between all the people. Some people write really detailed reports um, that, that track a lot of their information and others write more simple reports. So it's really about your style um, and what it is that you hope to gain from the writing. Uh, there are, we do ask you to answer all of the questions that does help us get a sense of the, pro the program. Um, but it, it really depends on the fellow and your mentors. Some mentors ask a lot of questions um, and want more information. So it's really tailored to your specific program. Um, hope that answers it. If again, if you have follow-ups for any of these, the question box is still live. Um, I'm going to move this to the timeline just so we have that in mind while we continue to answer questions. Um, the next question is, are there funds for the projects itself? Notebooks, pens, pencils, etc. Or should we use the stipend for it? Do you want to answer that, Vivica? Yeah, so there, so there's like, um, basically, the stipend is meant for you, not necessarily for the project. Uh, so there are ways to fundraise for your project. So there, like, strikes the Schweitzer Fellowship will put on a Fellows Fest, um, which basically um, has, like, everybody gets a web link um, to, like, a fundraising page. You can publicize it through social media or however else you want to do that. Um, and then also there's, like, a live event that the fellowship puts on, um, and people can donate at this, like, um, event. It's usually um, Fellows for Life and whoever you want to invite to this event. And they can, at, at this event, they can, like, either do cash, checks, credit card, whatever they want. And even when people uh, donate to you, um, like, yeah, like this is the web page. So if, even if people donate to you outside of this event and um, you, you just need to like hand that like money over to the fellowship and they'll enter it in and to their like pool. And so whenever you want to use that money, you just like turn it in and um, like a receipt or something and then they'll reimburse. Yeah. 
So I don't know if everyone can see their pages. I pulled up one of the fundraising pages to give you a sense of what those are like. Um, they talk a little bit about the person's project. They give it a, a goal for how much they hope to, to raise. And they talk a little bit about the fellowship. And then there's a big list of the, the folks who have donated to this project specifically. So that's you know one way that we're able to help support fellows in funding their projects because we do hope as Vivica mentioned for that stipend really to be for you um, as as a selected fellow um, so hopefully that's useful okay the next question oh it's just a thank you great if there are more questions please go ahead and, and type them in uh, to the questions portion over here um, I'll go over just this last little bit of information um, which is our, our timeline and more about our application itself so the application deadline is February 1st, 2020, which is, you know, seems like forever from now, but it's actually pretty soon. Um, we encourage you to take a look. We'll be sending out the application. We also, um, we also, it's on our website along with a bunch of other information about applying. Um, it's just a Word document. You go ahead and enter all that information. We ask that you, um, through this application, think about a project, right? Pitch something, basically. We understand that that will change, um, particularly because the first several months of our fellowship, we're asking you to go and do a needs and assets assessment. So you're going into community, um, asking and listening and thinking a lot about what, what might be an appropriate project to launch. Um, so in the application, we ask you for information about a project. That's a you know theoretical. Um, it's also possible, though, that some folks have already started work at a community site, and so they'll be pitching something that they're already doing. That's also completely fine. We're happy to take on those kinds of projects, um, or they're continuing a past fellows project. So um, somebody who's, for example, a current fellow right now um, might be interested in having somebody take over their project. And so if you work together with somebody to take over their project, you can definitely pitch that in your um, in your application. The application, the most important part of it for us is the personal statement portion. So we're asking what motivates you to do this kind of work? Um, what will make it meaningful to you? What would you bring to the program? What's exciting to you about having a cohort model? Uh, what would you stand to gain? What would you bring to the table? That's really important for us because that'll help us understand you know, what richness you'll bring to this cohort. It uh, looks like we have another question. We'll get to that in a second. Um, the fellowship year then, so the applications are due on, on February 1st. We have interviews in mid-March um, for about half of the people who apply. Um, and then final notifications go out at the end of March um, and your program year begins the last weekend in April orientation, officially May 1st. It's May 1st through May 31st, it's a 13 month program. Um, and once you graduate, you're a fellow for life, which is um, which is an alumni of the program. So you have access to all of our programming after that. Um, so that's the basic timeline. Um, the application itself is sort of like a grant application. We're definitely happy to get a copy of it from you in advance. If you have questions or if you want to work on something specific, we're happy to give you feedback. We have read a lot of applications and we are happy to um, give you feedback or help you understand something um, that's, that's exciting for us. And it also gives you an opportunity to make sure that you have all the pieces in the right places. Um, we can't accept all of the qualified applicants that we have. So it's important to really think about that personal statement portion, because that'll be the part that'll help us understand what would make you a great fit and what would help us um, in our fellowship have a really rich cohort. So let's see what else. We have another question. If you wanted to concentrate your volunteer work in the summer, is there anything that prohib prohibits you from doing this? Uh, no. So that's a great question. Thank you. Um, we see projects that are all completely unique. So each timeline is different. Um, we are excited to have fellows who are working on really different projects every year. So it's, it's um, normal for each project have a different timeline. We have, for example, two um, UIC Pritzker medical students this year who are almost completed with their hours. So they just started in May, we're only in October, and they're almost done with their whole fellowship because they really concentrated their hours in the, in the summer because they knew that they had big tests coming up in spring and they wanted to avoid those tests for their fellowship hours. So it's 
reasonable to think about your academics um, and your scheduling otherwise and the availability of the site. So that, you know, it's a great question about sites as well. So you'd want to pick a site then that had a lot of summer availability, not a school, for example, where maybe they don't have any programming at all over the summer. So it's important to think all that through, which is why you have a site mentor and an academic mentor. The academic mentor can help you think about what your program demands are and how those will dovetail with the fellowship um, or if there are any conflicts and what to think about in, in those contexts. For example, if you need IRB approval for something, we'd want you to work with your academic mentor to figure that out and make sure that you're you know, getting a start on that early enough. Um, and your site mentor can help you understand, you know, maybe they have a ton of people who come through on Wednesday nights. Um, so they wanna make sure that you really have a lot of availability on Wednesday nights and things really pick up in the fall. So once you understand that, um, you can structure your, your program accordingly. <clears throat> okay, we have another question. Should the 200 hours of required service all be direct on-site service, or does this include time needed for preparation, for example, preparing written educational materials? Great question. So 200 hours um, includes some time for preparation. Um, the vast majority of those hours are direct, so 130 of those must be face-to-face. -face. Direct hours, um, we allot up to 40, um, what we call indirect, so that's planning, um, shopping for materials, that sort of thing. And then there's an additional 20 hours that we allot to um, meeting time. So um, we give you credit for coming to our meetings because we think it's an important part of the program. We have guest speakers, we have all kinds of enriching curriculum within the program. So we give you credit for that as well. Um, because the vast majority of those required hours are direct service, um, we're hoping that you do something that doesn't require gobs of planning time, right? So it's important to us that you're thinking about something that um, that maybe you can find an existing curriculum for and you can modify, um, or that you can you can do a lot of the, the learning together with the people in the community because the, that 40 hours of indirect time, it goes really quick. So we want you to think of something that could be sustainable in that way. That's a great question. Um, are there other questions? Hope I didn't miss any. Those are some really good questions. Thank you for bringing so much to the table. That's really helpful for us when we're um, going through this information to really hear from you what it is that you're interested in. Um, one thing I should point out, I guess, with this uh, question is your hours can't duplicate for anything. So if you're required um, for a program that you're working on or for a school program uh, to do a certain number of community hours, they can't be counted for the fellowship as well. It has to be unique, separate hours. Okay, not hearing other questions currently. So I will go ahead and wrap up. Um, thank you all so much for coming to the webinar. Um, it's been exciting to, uh, to hear your questions and to, um, to be able to give you some of this information. The fellowship is a really exciting opportunity. Uh, it builds these lifelong connections for folks who are involved, they stay involved. We sent a delegation to Tulsa this past year. Vivica was mm -hmm. part of that group um, to meet up with fellows and fellows for life from all over the country. So it's a really rich experience and with like lasting, um, lasting impacts on your career. We have fellows for life who continue to be involved um, from our program's inception. Here in Chicago in 1996, we have a fellow who's currently receiving C grants, a small grant funding to continue doing community work from that very first class. So it's a kind of a, um, an exciting opportunity to really connect with a group of like-minded folks. Um, of course, feel free to reach out to me. Um, if you have any questions that you think of later, we're always happy to answer them. Um, myself or Karen, my coworker, um, please feel free to be in touch with us. Um, it's been it's been fun to, to chat with you all, and uh, we're excited to see your applications anytime between now and February first. <laughs>